you've probably heard the word periodization thrown around a bit by coaches or sports scientists before and it's the it's the main thing that goes into building out an annual plan or a training plan overall. There's a bit of a theory behind, a theory behind it in terms of where should we place certain types of sessions, chase certain adaptations in the year, how do we actually structure everything. So today I'm gonna to break down what periodization actually is, a couple of different models of periodization or theories that you can use and follow to be able to build your training programs. And then a few things that are kind of wrong with the, the whole periodization um, idea or, or concept in general and how we can sort of work around it based on different types of athletes. So stick around, watch the video and you'll learn everything about periodization pretty quick hey guys nick here welcome back to the channel talking science of endurance and sports science in general if you haven't already please hit the subscribe button down below to follow on for some more content coming soon hopefully you've been enjoying it so far and really good to see plenty of people commenting and asking for for particular videos and it's something that i want to go through today because it has come up as a question before what is this whole thing around periodizations it is a term periodization that that gets talked about a lot when we go into things like building an annual plan, strategically building out a training plan leading up to a race, how do we actually put things in, where do things go, the strategy behind it, the tactics behind it, all comes down to this concept of periodization. And it's really, periodization is just planning or, or strategically planning training and preparation to lead up to a particular event. And if we go back to the roots of periodization, essentially in the, the really, when I say the olden days, mid 1900s when we're building up to Olympic games, there'd be one one major event for the year, minimal travel, athletes weren't traveling back and forth between, between countries, there'd be one big event for the year. So we're building up to that. And really the earliest form of periodization model was just a consistent increase, 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 increase. We hit the event and we should be ready to go. So what I mean by increase is increase training load, increase training volume, increase the intensity gradually. And it's just this linear progression of just up and up and up and up. And what some of the, some of the coaches at the time saw was a lot of athletes start to break down towards the end of that and they weren't actually reaching a peak performance by the Olympic Games at the end or the major competition for the year. So they start to get a little bit clever and, and go, all right, maybe we need to peak a couple of times a year. We're going to do sort of a mini peak early, have a bit of recovery, and then we're going to just build a, li a shorter block but build towards the major competition and peak again. And what they found was results started to improve because athletes got a little bit, got all this time to build up a chronic training load behind them, build up a bit in terms of their performance, be able to peak, test that, understand where they were at, recover, and then go again. So we had this kind of like two peak system. Obviously it's then developed further and further and the more competition we have now, the more peaks in a season we can have. And, and typically a lot of triathletes and, and runners might have a couple of races, three to four key races in the year, some lead in races, and we've got peaks all, all over the place. And the higher up the chain you go, the more to the elite end of the spectrum where they're racing all the time, the more peaks we might have across and it starts to get quite complex. We then have a couple of different theories that stem from some of that early stuff around, well, how do we structure some of these peaks and how do we work towards these peaks to then target specific adaptations? And it really got into the point where science, sports science, as it was sort of evolving as sports science and, and understanding what was going on physiologically in the human body a lot better and technology involved, uh, evolved and we could, we could understand what actually was happening, a lot of people started and coaches sports scientists started to look at all right maybe if we train specific blocks and this is where the whole block periodization theory comes into play um, and it's called block periodization is let's do a, a group of four or a, or a block if you like of four weeks where we just focus on one adaptation so again a lot of this stems from stuff that you do in the gym but i'll bring it into the endurance context so from a gym perspective they're looking at all right well, what do we want to do first we need to build some muscle mass to then build our strength to then express that in our sport. So we need to look at hypertrophy, building muscle mass first. We're then gonna do some, um, and we're gonna train that for four weeks and then we're gonna train our strength because we've got the muscle mass now, we've increased our size. Now we can build the strength in those muscles and then in the last block, we can transfer that into power and express that for the specific sport. It's the same in endurance where they start to look at, all right, let's build the engine first. And it's a theory that I still follow and, and follow a little bit is we need to build the engine first because without the engine, we can't then build the cylinders into the engine. And without the cylinders in the engine, we can't then tune it. So it's VO2 max looking at sort of the lactate threshold and then peaking and, and very race specific by the end of it. So it it's this theory of we, we do one block of training that leads into the next, that leads into the next. And then we might be able to cycle that back around if, we have, if we're not peaking for a race or it should lead to a bit of a peaking tapering sort of period where then we're ready to go for competition because we've gone through these, these phases or blocks if you like. That then sort of molded into what we call phase potentiation. And the, the overall concept of block periodization is that we get this, this building effect. 
the first block or the first phase causes the second phase to be or, or allows the second phase to grow on top of it and allows the third phase to grow on top of that and it's this constant step up step up step up it also started to incorporate a little bit of variety into the training program because we have a group of four weeks where we do pretty similar things again and again and again deload maybe on the fourth week and then the next group of four weeks is a completely different set of training or, or a modified set of training and then the next group of four is different again so the variety start to help athlete performance as well decreases a bit of the monotony it doesn't get as boring because you're constantly changing each four weeks you're doing something a little bit different um the building effects start to work as well where it started to fall down though is as we start to increase the number of events that athletes are doing each year you just don't have time i mean for an endurance athlete who might be peaking three times a year yeah you've probably got that time because if you can spend a month on just working on your vo2 or two months just working on your vo2 and then two months working on your or one to two months working on your your uh, your, your lactate threshold working on your FTP and then another month to, to peak and taper into the race and really get you fired up and ready to go yeah great if you can repeat that twice a year there's two main races and you can't really do anything else but from a professional athlete standpoint where those those guys and girls are racing almost what it seems like each weekend but will be racing regularly one big race a month whether that's a 70.3 or an Ironman or a, or a marathon they're racing almost monthly every six weeks it's the type of thing that that just doesn't work. So what we need is we start to look at, a, a, I guess, an un, what they call an undulating model where it's just peaks and troughs based on where the races are. So do we have an A, if we have an A race, all right, we need to be really fresh and ready to go for that A race and we might have a, a bit more of a focus on building towards that. A B and a C race, less important, that might come as a lead up to that. All right, we might just train through them a bit more and not have as much emphasis. So we could undulate to where the key events are. Even more specifically, when we get to that higher train status, we need more variety as well. Um, there's only so much you can do in each of those blocks when we look at block periodization. If we're just focusing on one adaptation, we're just focusing on VO2 max, there's only so much you can develop until you need to develop something else. It's, it's like anything. You train something or practice something enough, you get so good at it, but until you provide a different stimulus to give the body a new challenge you're just going to sort of plateau. And this is where a lot of athletes get stuck in their, their training is they just do the same thing again and again and again. They just do race-specific stuff all the time, which is really great if you're race-specific for a particular point in your training cycle. Like if you're trying to run four-minute Ks for uh, a 5K run, for example, and you're trying to beat 20 minutes, if you only do that again and again and again, you're only going to get to 20-minute 5K or maybe a 19.55K. It's not going to help you get down to an 18 or a 17. You have to change the style of what you're doing. You might have to boost the engine size to then come back and do the race specific stuff. Or you might already have a really big engine, but you can't produce it on a high intensity. Like, like a, you, you're a really big engine, you can run all day, but you can't um, then translate that into a fast 5K. So now you need to work on the race specific stuff. So you can see how it's it, it kind of, that, that block periodization can work if we've just got one one goal at the end of a say a six month build which for a lot of longer distance athletes might like might actually work a 70.3 or an Ironman you might want to spend four to six months just building towards that and you don't race in between coming off winter and racing something like Sunshine Coast Half Ironman um, Western Sydney Busso whatever it may Busso Full whatever it may be those types of things are, yeah probably is the perfect time to maybe follow a bit more of a block periodization and, and, and use a two month block of VO2 and then a two month block etc there and I use that quite a lot for more so that when I say beginner to intermediate athlete because it can produce quite a very clear adaptation. It's also a very clear idea of what your training is actually doing. You go in and you know this part of my training is focused on boosting engine size. This part of my training is focused on the race specific stuff. It can give you a lot of motivation and actually um, sort of keep you ticking along because you go there's purpose to my training. It's it's a very very sort of subtle way of if manipulating the psychology of training performance to be able to get a really positive adaptation at the end but also for a beginner or intermediate athlete it's a really effective way of boosting up some of these physical attributes so if we just do some really dedicated focus on it here we can boost up a lot faster we accelerate the rate of growth in a, re in a really highly trained professional athlete though and the higher trained you get and when I say highly trained I probably mean anything you've got to be one or two top one one to th you've got to be on the podium in your age group essentially or you're an elite professional that's where the higher variety and variability has to come into it because 
if we just go away and do one block of um, the same thing again and again and again, it might work. If you haven't done that for a while, it might work for the short term, but long term, it's not gonna do as much. We have to continually provide a challenging stimulus and we can get a little bit more creative in what we do. And this is where some of the, the crazy sessions that you might see on Zwift from professional riders come in and, and they dump it in. And it doesn't work for the typical age group athlete when a pro rider puts a Zwift session up and you go and try and do it. It doesn't work for the typical athlete because you're not ready for that type of training. They might do a session where they've got, it seems weird, they've got stuff everywhere. There's there's a there's a 20 minute zone two block and then they're doing over-unders sort of um, partway through the session and they're, then they're going and doing some 30 second all out efforts um, more for the VO2 style things. And then they're coming back and doing a tempo based effort and then they do some more zone two they need that variety because one, it's really race specific. That's what a professional rider might do. But then also they need that variety to get those different stimuluses or stimuli in their sessions um, to be able to improve all attributes because all their attributes are already at 99 out of 100. They're just trying to get that extra one point um, or 1%. Whereas the typical age group athlete, all their attributes are probably 50 to 60 out of 100. And if we just focus on one at a time, we can boost that up to 70 quite quickly. We can boost that up to 80 quite quickly out of 100. Then we move to the next one. We can boost that up to 70 or 80, but this one comes down a little. So by the end of the whole process and, and the parts building on each other, bit of phase potentiation, we get to a point where all of them may be, instead of being 50 like they started at, they're all maybe 65 or 70. Great, that's going to lead to a better performance overall. We just go through and do it again. But like I said, the, the professional athlete who's already at 99 in, across the whole board, they're trying to just get to 100. It, it, doing a block of here might get them to 100 there, but it might be at the detriment of all those other qualities as well. And because they're racing so frequently, they just don't have the time to make it up. So they need to follow what we call an undulating model and can also be a bit of a, getting really specific, what we call a daily undulating model and tactical periodization where it's, all right, we're peaking at specific times in the week to then be able to race weekly um, to what we see a lot in team sport athletes not necessarily endurance but team sport athletes they have obviously a race or a, comp a race competition every week a game match every week they, t they aim to peak at the end of the week and then recover peak at the end of the week recover peak at the end of the week so it's this constant rolling cycle whereas a, a triathlete or a runner um, cyclist might be racing every second week or every third week so we're, we're constantly trying to peak and there's no real time to have a, a block where we can just focus on some lower intensity stuff or some middle intensity stuff it's well we got to be race ready go 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 all the time so we've got to have a bit more of an undulating style and a lot of amateur athletes might see this in sort of summer when there's more racing but it's the type of thing that you can try to get away with it because the, those bigger jumps and like i said 50 to 70 percent in a in a particular attribute by doing a block probably is going to lead to a bigger performance improvement than if you tried to do undulating and you went from 50% to 51 and everything because you just went, oh, I'm going to do a bit of this, bit of this, bit of this. And too much variety is almost detrimental at that point. You've got to save that more advanced stuff for professionals who need that variation to get that one, one point. Take the easy 10, 15 points by doing a bit of a block. So probably the last thing I want to talk about, and that's a bit on periodization theory and the concept of periodization what's actually going on the last thing i want to talk about is um why periodization almost doesn't really matter in terms of the type of the, the type of periodization model you follow and this is probably more for the sports scientists and the coaches out there it doesn't really matter as long as you can justify and you can show evidence as to how it's going to produce the result that you're looking for um these are just models and concepts they're theories they're that well it worked back in however many years ago in eastern european um weightlifters and things like that is where the original stuff came from we're applying these models and concepts to other sports and and other situations and obviously we're advanced in time so there is going to be some difference to them and you can tweak them but like there's no there's no right or wrong you don't have to use block periodization you don't have to use undulating you might use a bit of a combination of both and i certainly do this with a number of athletes is when we do have some races back to back to back we go towards that undulating stock because it makes sense. We don't we don't necessarily want to be completely off. We don't want to be completely on and, and be too fatigued for a race. We want to be just peaking at the right time for each of those. But if we're in an off-season or we're in an early pre-season sort of stage where we've got six months out, we might do a block periodization style because it's going to give us some clear driven focus in those sessions. Um, and in that, that period of time, it's then going to allow us to build on and, and have a bit more dedicated focus on maybe a weaker attribute. That's where testing and things like that come into as well. So... In summary, periodization is, is really a concept overall. It's, it's not something that you necessarily have to follow a particular pattern or a particular style. Everyone might be a little bit different. Individual athletes might respond better to different styles of periodization. Like I said, typically at the higher end of the spectrum, you need that undulating, lower end of 
lesser trained lower end of the spectrum athletes amateurs might need a bit more of the block style play with it though each athlete's a little bit different do undulating for a little bit period um, or a period of time do the block style for a period of time they're going to have their pros and cons regardless of which one you use it's just making sure you're using it at the appropriate times for the appropriate stage of the athlete as well that's probably the key if you can take all of these different types of concepts of planning a, a training plan overall and implement them at the right time for the right athlete you're going to get the positive result um, it's where you don't get the positive result is where you've probably used maybe an incorrect style or something else is going on in that training as well so Hopefully that's that's given you a bit of an idea on periodization. I don't want to go too on, too long because I know a lot of a lot of conversation around periodization, particularly in sports science, and it, it can get quite lengthy and very complex. It doesn't have to be. Break it down really simple, and that's what my channel is all about. Keep it really simple. I mean, I'm looking at here. I've only been recording for sort of 15 minutes, and, and we've basically covered everything you need to know. So, hopefully you like the video. If you have, please leave a comment down below in terms of how you plan your sessions, do you, or your training overall. Do you follow maybe a closer to a block periodization or phase potentiation style? Do you daily undulate or do you monthly undulate? However, have you do it? Do you have any questions about maybe what you should be switching to, maybe a specific case study? Feel free to leave that down below as well. Again, if you haven't already, please hit the subscribe button. Uh, definitely helps in terms of keeping me going and, and giving me some positivity to work off to then make some more videos. So if you haven't already, hit that one down below. And that's it for today. We'll see you in the next one.